Hi guys, this is Chris Martin from the band Coldplay. I'm going to be showing you today how Beardy Man makes his music. Here is his live rig, which he makes his music on. It's dope, and I'm going to show you how to use it, whether you like it or not. Behind me is a computer, the computer that he made, the soon-to-be smash hit release, 6am Ready to Write, featuring Joe Rogan on all streaming platforms. Let's get into it. I've made uh, a sort of live production system based around Ableton Live, and this is like the fifth or something iteration of my live rig. It used to be hardware when I started out, I was using chaos pads, other things like that. Um, and my, my gear grew and grew and it got heavier and heavier and more accident prone and just difficult to manage, difficult to use. And every piece of new hardware that I wanted the functionality of would degrade the signal path further. Um, so I decided to make my own software, which a guy called Dave Gamble from DMG Audio made. He's a genius. Uh, and he built me this live production system from scratch in C++. It's, it's like, um, it is what you can see. One, two, three, four iPads, a Novation Launchpad, a Looper by um, Boss, it's the RC505. Um, and all of that sort of works with this laptop which is running Ableton. And I've got this immense Ableton rig. Well, I say immense. Maybe it's not the biggest in the world, but it's, it's a bit mad. Um, it's basically a drum machine and a, a sort of multiple loopers all um, splayed out into different categories of instrument. And uh, it's a lot. So I'll try and explain what it is, how it works, how I use it, and the kind of things that, that I can do with it. So I guess I'll start uh, at the beginning of the signal path. So this iPad controls all of the stuff that uh, is coming in to the system. It's the first thing in the, in the, in the signal chain. So um, the way I've got it set up is that <coughs> if I want to do a loop like that, um, once that's in there, the only effects at my disposal are the inbuilt effects in the looper, which are pretty good, but they're more charming than they are deep. Um, some of them are decidedly cheap and nasty, but have a really gritty feel to them. So they're good to use. Um, and you can, there's a lot that you can get out of them. But I wanted something a bit more finesse than that for the way in, because you've got effects in this looper for the way in, but I didn't want to use them. Um, purely because you can only have three at a time and I wanted to have all of them, you know, set to arbitrary settings at any, any one time. So there's a ring mod, which is available at any time. There's a drive available at any time, sort of spectral weirdness, uh, vinyl kind of thing. There's all kinds of stuff, um, you know, and I've got, uh, you know, auto filters and all kinds of things. But they, you know, they are kind of one finger, two fingers at a time things. But um, what I've got here are the presets, which um, it's a bit like a Nord keyboard in the sense that there's no, there's nothing hidden. So in the previous uh, iteration of my live rig, there was lots hidden. Um, you had to go into menus to do stuff, which meant that there was a lot of functionality hidden. But now everything is squeezed onto the one page. So if I want, I can turn my voice into a choir or this setting, this setting, this setting, this setting. But you can't, you can't, you, you guys in the room can't hear what that's doing, but it's dope. Uh, but I, I could. <laughs> so I can instantly switch to any one of these, I think it's like 20 something different presets. And if you can look at the screen, each one of the presets changes all of these settings here. So I can then go in and so I can take it down to take it away or I could bring it Maybe that's not the best example. If I want to turn into a bass, then I can kind of edit the setting as I go. Everything is always available to me at all times. Um, I didn't want to have um, I didn't want to have just a static preset anywhere in the system. I wanted to be able to kind of mold it as I go. So 
Okay, so each each preset is just a starting point. So yeah, 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 yo, 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 yo. So what's actually doing that? Um, that is uh, it's called manipulator. Um, I momentarily forgot who makes it, but um, that will appear on the screen here. Um, yeah, and it's actually it's made by the guys that. Uh, that are infected mushroom, the trans guys, but um, I just can't remember what they called their company. But either way, yeah, um, so that's that really. So yeah, if, if, there's lots going on under the hood in terms of, like for example, if I want to pitch my voice up, then I can do that immediately. And there's a macro where if I start pitching my voice up, it immediately turns the wet dry knob to wet, um, but I can turn that down again so I can I can do sort of octavized stuff. The... Anyway, none of this kind of makes much sense when it's out of context. So I suppose when I make music with it, you can kind of hear why or why I've taken those decisions. There's another thing in here, which is the, um, it, it's like a vocal sampler and um, it's called Crossfade Loop Synth by Expert Sleepers. And it's a VST that enables you to sam arbitrarily sample instantly. Like, uh, uh, but then again, I've got the same kind of methodology with these presets here where they change. I don't know if you can see. Can you get a close up on that? Um, oh, any of these? Supposed to be ex like explaining how it works, but essentially it doesn't make much sense unless you actually use it. So yeah, so there I just use a, a base preset, which is Manipulator by, and um, yeah, and then I was playing in. Oh, so, so it's all vocal. Um, that was a line that I just recorded, which uh, without any effects on it sounds like uh, literally just a cross faded loop of. Oh, sorry. Just a few settings, just some simple subtractive stuff, you end up getting. Which isn't that impressive, but all you need to do is put on some effects and you can get sort of lush pads. None of that's rocket science. It's just that, like, it's amazing to me how little you need to do to get that, you know. You can you can have the the most amazing synth in the world, but you can be really impactful just from you know a very basic sampler, which crossfade loop synth essentially is, and Tornado by Sugar Bites, which is what's after it in the signal chain, um, which is very it's, they're very basic effects and they're not really meant to be like it's not meant to be like a an effects you know workstation, but that's what I use it as because it's really low latency and that's really important. So this rig is really really heavily optimized for live use. So I've got it down to 64 samples, which is crazy considering how much there is in this. So it's like a full, you know, Ableton as Ableton rig. So there's also, I'll explain that in a minute, but there's like a, there's a whole other side to it, which is like pre-recorded loops and pre-produced tracks all split out into loads of different parts. And it's also a production environment as well. It's like a sort of giant spidery template of every sort of possibility that I could want. But I also will produce sometimes just from scratch as well, because there's no reason to be limited by a template. But yeah, so um, it's an interesting way of working, but it just means that I can um, I can be very instant when I'm just using this machine. It's kind of a quick and dirty looper. Um, if you want it to be, it can be a bit deeper if you want it to be. But, um, you know, Boss may or may not be working on a follow up to it.
yeah, so that's all the input stuff. I was using lots of that there. We've already covered that. Um, so I was using all the other stuff as well. Um, oh, I didn't yet use all of it, to be honest. There's so much in here that I don't know if I could cover it all. But essentially, I was doing something there which uh, could be called iterative resampling, although both those terms, I think, are mathematically incorrect. So I don't know what to call it. But essentially, you have a signal path going back into itself, just like a delay line. But it goes through effects and gets resampled into back into a looper. And the looper I'm using, um, when well, I'm not using this one, uh, I've got like six instances of it. And again, it's by expert sleepers. It's called Augustus Loop. See what they did there. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a good looper. It's very capable. It's basically a delay line, but it's got lots of pretty advanced looping features. Not crazy advanced, but just advanced enough that it's, it is the best one out there. Um, there aren't really any good VST loopers, there's standalone stuff, uh, there is hardware, but if you really want something meaty that is actually a VST that you can use in Ableton, your only real option at this point is Augustus Loop. And the reason for that is because it compensates for latency. Um, and you'd think that um, a DAW would sort of do that anyway as part of how VST works, or at least they would do with their native stuff, but Ableton's looper does not compensate for latency. So if that's something that you care about, you know, if you're thinking of doing looping in Ableton, you will come across that problem. If you start to pile effects into an effects chain and you have a looper in there somewhere, you'll quickly see that um, the you know you're trying to hit a kick drum. You know, you're trying to hit it with a snare right on the kick, and the snare will always be slightly off, which is madness. I don't know why Ableton don't correct that. I've asked them to. And they're like, <laughs> no. So um, yeah, uh, so I have to use Augustus Loop, which is fine because it's amazing. And I actually don't even use most of the, the features in it. Um, but yeah, so that's what I use, six instances, six instances of that. Um, so yeah, I was recording. So I've got in the system, I've got these things that are blinking here. That thing there tells me that into the looper channel, I've got the uh, the input coming into the looper channel. So that's going into all the loopers at the moment. Or I can have each of these individual loopers here feed into themselves or feed into any of the other loopers in the system. So in this way, I can kind of do resamples um, you know, from any looper to any looper. So in lieu of like an actual offline copy and or bounce function, that's what I have in the system. Um, or th this square here is the whole melody group, I call it, which is everything that's on this iPad. Bass, melody, pads. So it's a combination of uh, the Ableton pads, which is you know pre-recorded stuff, um, and synthesis and stuff like that, um, pre-recorded melodic stuff, pre-recorded vocal samples, yeah, all the pre-recorded stuff, a 303 emulator. Um, but yeah, all of that is grouped into a big bus called melodic group. And then I can kind of uh, I can mute it, unmute it. I've got another set of effects here, which is actually it's Tornado and another instance of Manipulator. So I can do kind of mad granular stuff, which I don't think I even used in that, but maybe I'll do another demo in a sec showing it. Um, yeah, but they're, they're, yeah, there is so much in it, it'd be difficult to kind of show everything that it can do. But that's the short and the long of it, is that there's loopers and effects and there's pre-triggered loops. Um, or there's, there's pre-configured stuff, but everything is adaptable. There's nothing that's hidden from these interfaces, which is why they're so crowded. So I'm not necessarily trying to make all this music fresh, or I'm not trying to get the system into, into fresh states all the time, because I have presets to do that, but once I'm in them, then I can manipulate them. Um, like I've got a, uh, th these are the presets here. And these presets are, uh, so for example, these are tracks which I'm working on and which I play live. But that's like, so I can, I can sort of take that and then immediately remix it. And I'll show you how to.
But that's the kind of thing is you can sort of endlessly endlessly sample things back into themselves and you can go really weird and deep and techno if you want. Um, but yeah, that's very kind of weird. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you want to go deep and techno -y with this stuff, you can. Um, and if you want to do sort of quick and dirty, you can. You kind of stick to this machine, but you can also go pretty deep with that. But yeah, there's lots. Yeah, so there's, there's pre-recorded stuff in here. There's, uh, or, but you can also use it as a production system as well. So you can just record a bunch of stuff and, um, and then you can kind of snip bits out of it and stick it in, in the other parts of Ableton. So yeah, so when I'm playing live, that stuff there is what I see and that's how I interact with it. But now let's take a little look at the brains of the operation, Ableton Live. Uh, this is how the session looks when you scan across it. I did have everything grouped into groups, but I kind of got it in my head that the groups were adding latency. I don't know whether that's true. I probably should have found out, but um, there also there were some quirks in the way that this was working, which meant that it was actually more straightforward just to colorize sections rather than actually group them and to manually group. So for example, this red one here, uh, these groups here that I've just highlighted, no, that didn't make it any clearer. These groups, oh God, these groups here that I'm highlighting, uh, sorry, these channels here that I'm highlighting are all base and they all feed into, the all these feed into there. So it's just manually rooted in Ableton and I found that that, that made things less complex if I just did that manually than actually using Ableton's uh, native grouping schema. Um, yeah, so let's go from the very top. Yeah, so here is the utilities section, which is MIDI routing, essentially. Um, so bye-bye, boring. Um, well, is it boring? Yes. Uh, <laughs> there I've got my input channel, so I kind of go from left to right um, along the signal chain. Um, so I've got my Vox stuff, that's all my input stuff. I've got everything in a giant rack. Um, I've got manipulator. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, here's Manipulator, and Manipulator is by uh, Infected Mushroom, whose company is called Polyverse, and it looks like some alien technology, and it sounds like alien technology. It's pretty sick. It, um, it's, it's so sick. I couldn't do the kind of noises that I make without this. It's amazing. Um, so that's first in the signal path, and then you've got Artillery, which I actually use just to do um, audio frequency delays, which is just an effect. I didn't think. I don't think I even did that when I was demoing it, uh, but that's what it does. Um, then I've got Salty Grain by Sample Sumo, which I've used for years, and that is just a really good um, granular cloud maker. So it gives you that kind of crystal shimmer effect if you wanted to, or it can kind of, you know, iteratively feed back into these kind of weird atonal clouds of noise, which is horrifying and I love doing. Uh, what else? Yeah, ring modulator. So there's a lot of, I've, I've, there are way better effects than I have in this system that I actually own, um, but I, I can't use them in this live rig because they either introduce just a little bit of latency or a little bit too much CPU. So there's nothing in here that takes up more than, you know, a percent or two of CPU. And that wasn't like a hard and fast rule I set. It's just that I've spent a good year optimizing the hell out of this so that it's just, it's yeah, 64 samples of throughput latency, which considering everything that it does, it's been difficult to achieve. So there's a lot of stuff that I would normally do in a production, which we'll see in the next video when I actually show you a track that I produce not with this template, but just from scratch where if it's not a live performance set, um, then you can use expensive plugins and it will sound sweeter and you can, you, you can do better things, but you just, there's always gonna be a compromise when you're trying to reduce the latency and the CPU usage of a live rig. Um, so yeah, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of native Ableton stuff, which just does the job, is stable, and doesn't introduce latency, but I, it's, it's pretty cool still. Um, yeah, like Ableton just released in version 10, they have this new 
echo thing, which is a kind of fairly average um, tape delay emulation. It's not the best that there is, but it is the lowest latency and is the lowest CPU use. There were some really cool things that I was looking forward to do, like filtering, um, and they all had little quirks and idiosyncrasies, and they don't all work in the same way with VST sync. Um, so yeah, it's been a really long journey to try and find plugins that will respond in the way that I need them to live. I suppose it's just worth saying that if you're building a live rig, it's a completely different task to producing a track which only lives in your studio and is not required to be performative in any way. If you want to have sound going through a session, you've got to keep latency low. And um, if it's beatboxing, you've got to be bang on because you've got to hit the exact transient or as close as you possibly can. Um, so if you're just a singer, then you can afford to give yourself loads of latency if you want. You can give yourself like 128 samples, 256 samples even, you can probably get away with. But you can't do that if it's beatboxing. So uh, I suppose that's worth saying because that affects the choices that I've made in, in this particular rig. So I've got a drum machine in here, I guess, of my own design. It's not really a design, it's just a configuration of native Ableton stuff. Because, I mean, there are so many amazing drum machines. There's Max for Live stuff I was looking into. There's, there's all kinds of stuff, but I just found that actually I wanted to just pare it down and use Ableton as it's supposed to be used. But even then, I found that to have a system that enables you to punch in and out like a drum machine would, uh, you have to do quite a bit of fiddling to get Ableton to do that. So the way that I've done this is as follows. I've got a drum machine group. I've got an output for kick elements. So I've got a deep kick output and then the kicks themselves. And there's 128 kicks in there because I'm using the, uh, the drum rack. Um, you know, and you've got to watch that as well because that can introduce lots of CPU overhead if you start using every single feature. Um, you just got to be careful with the amount of effects that you pile on. So there's been a lot of kind of level management in trying to make this work, uh, but I digress. So all of these things feed into this kick output. And um, the reason why there's nothing on the kick output channel is because I like to have dummy clips. So these dummy clips um, are audio clips, but they contain nothing other than automation. Uh, so I can send a MIDI message to change the status of the on off um, or it can be automated so there were a bunch of ways that you can implement stuff like this and I played about with all of them so um, one way to organize this would actually be to have all the drums in the same rack um, and then to use the internal routing system within the rack let me just find it so yeah here's the here's a kick rack so you're right, there's a million different ways of organizing stuff in Ableton Live. I don't even know if I'm doing it the best way, but I'm doing it the best way that I found. And it took me a long time to, to deliberate over what was the way that was going to work. And originally, I wanted to have just one rack that would be all the drums for any particular given genre, and then to kind of use the sends within the drum rack to send to different sends. And I quickly found that it was not intuitive visually. Um, or cognitively, I suppose, to, to do that. Because um, you can't immediately see what is muted and unmuted. And I wanted to be able to, to use the channels. So you can use the channels in Ableton, but then you have other trade-offs. It's like, I mean, I don't know, I could go into loads of detail just about the structure of the drum rack, the structure of how I've laid out the, you know, it's like snares, which are grouped, which have their, their own drum racks, um, snare loops, they go into, so I've got BAPS as a, as a category, which is everything, which is clap, snare, rim, snaps, kicks, which is a kind of grouping for everything kick related. Um, and then I've got, you know, I've got clap loops, um, you know, rim shots, which is another, another rack, which is not fully f filled out, but there's time yet. 
uh, symbols, which is closed hats, open hats, and rise. So that was a weird one because I wanted to have, you know, closed hats being able to choke um, open hats. But I quickly found that it was going to be tricky to turn the closed hats on or off. Um, it was it was just getting a bit fiddly, and I just decided that eventually I would forego being able to have the uh, the open hats be choked by the closed hats, um, because actually I figured that on a drum machine, sometimes you just want to have them both going at the same time. Like in dance music, you don't necessarily have um, closed hats always choking open hats. So it's kind of I thought a lot about choking open hats and whether or not it was necessary. And I was like, well, it's mostly electronic music that I'm doing rather than trying to emulate an actual drum kit. Um, so that was my reasoning for for grouping them like that. But like I say, there's no one way to do this. You can do any way you want. It's possible to imagine a, a version of this where I went with my first instincts and just piled on through and tried to find a way. Um, but I suppose like anything, you know, I, I was building this system and there's been decisions taken along the way that sometimes I'll look back and I'll be like, why on earth did I do that? And then I'll sort of go back on myself and and try and re-engineer it. And then I'm like, oh no, that's why, because this one thing is a blocker. So, um, I mean, so for example, with the groups, if you want to group things in Ableton, you will find that the group channel itself doesn't have, uh, you can't put dummy clips in that column. So if you want to have dummy clips over a whole group, you have to manually send. So that was the reason for that, which is why this looks so big, you can't compact it. Um, it would be nice if there was a version of a dummy clip that just existed in the group channel, but Ableton haven't done that. There's a bunch of stuff that Ableton should definitely do that they haven't done. Because I just thought, you know, oh, Ableton, it's, it's designed for live music production and music production done as swiftly as possible, but there are some things that it just can't do. And Ableton want Max for Live to be this open environment that is infinitely configurable, but that can only operate within certain parameters uh, you can build Max for Live devices, but often, you know, they're not super pro, they're a bit shaky, they can destabilize the system, they can add latency. Um, yeah, from my perspective, there is no Max for Live in here. None. Like, I have put so many Max for Live devices in here. Uh, I wanted to do preset morphing. I wanted to go from one preset to another seamlessly. Um, there's clearly a hunger for that. There were loads of preset morphers that I found. Some of them were compatible at one point, and then they lose their compatibility with an update of Ableton, or they only work in a certain way, or they just don't quite work. A lot of time has been wasted uh, in my life looking through Max for Live libraries and trying to instantiate them. I suppose the only real way to work with Max for Live is to do it yourself, and uh, and I don't know how to Max for Live, so there is no Max for Live in here. Maybe one day I'll get into it, but for now. It's just all native, bare bones, super low CPU, high level of reliability. Um, yeah, I think that covers that. Um, but yeah, I've just got my groupings of like percussion, which is grouped into shakers, tambourines, woods, um, woods and metal, hand drums. Yeah, I've got um, my melodic group, which is vocal samples, which is grouped into samples, another, sam another group of samples and sampler, bass, and you've got your so this is what a, uh, a looper channel looks like, is you've got Augustus loop, which looks like this. Um, it's not pretty, but nor's your mum. Uh, this is Tornado. Uh, Tornado is amazing, and uh, uh, some of the presets in Tornado, like in the actual modules themselves, are actually, were built specially for me, um, because the guys at, at um, Sugarbytes are legends. Um, yeah, I've got a bunch of categories here. Uh, I've, I've zoomed out my Ableton page more than I've ever seen anyone zoom it out, but it's just because I like to be able to see as much as possible. Um, yeah, the uh, arpeggiator that I use is a, um, I should say, for, for ARP elements, I'm using a 303 emulator, and I did some research to find out which one was the best one. And um, by a country mile, it seemed to be this one. I'm open to suggestions of others if people think there are better ones. Like maybe there's some 303 emulators that do more, that do stuff that a 303 
couldn't do, but this one is about as faithful as you can get. And then all these sound tests, this one comes out on top. Um, so it's by Audio Realism, it's called Baseline 3. And it is dope. Um, yeah, I don't think there's much else to say other than I did have more synthesis in here. And I, I, I was thinking, you know, I'll make this a kind of all singing, all dancing production rig which I'll, I'll, I'll only ever have to use this one template again. But I think that's mental. I think giving yourself just the one template and never using any other is a stupid idea. I, I did want to pursue it, but I found that actually, if you want to do that, you can't keep the latency down. So much of the time I will produce from scratch. And um, that's what I'm going to show you next. Oh, that was great, wasn't it? Well, there's another bit to this video. It's really good, it's even better than this one. Um, but you can't see it unless you buy a copy of Computer Music. So buy a copy of Computer Music. I'll see you later. <laughs>